So as promised, it's been a month since episode 4 of the Ask the e Q&A, so welcome to episode 5. So this time around, we do have quite a few questions. Thank you guys so much for the questions, most definitely keep them coming. And we are going to begin with the questions that were left in the comment section of last month's Q&A video. Is it okay to have a shutter speed of 1 over 50th of a second to 24p videos? Yes, that is perfectly okay. And what happens when you put it on a 23.98 timeline on FCPX? Okay. It can be a little confusing, but 23.98 is really just 23.976, but 23.98 slash 976 is not the same as 24.00. So there are two different frame rates, even though they're in the ballpark of 24 frames per second, but it is never a good idea to mix them. It is always a good idea to keep in mind what your final delivery frame rate will be and then shoot in that frame rate. If you mix 23.98 footage with 24p footage on, say, a 24 P timeline. If it's a short video, you might get away without any issues, but if it is a longer timeline, then you might experience synchronizing issues with your audio. So what happens if you put 24p on a 23.98 timeline in FCPX? What I believe is going to happen is the software is going to drop out a frame every now and then. Hi, I have a small suspicion that you are from Malaysia slash Singapore. Question, as a student, how do you afford to purchase your equipment? Well, you do have a pretty good eye because I'm kind of from both those countries. I was born in Singapore, but I am a Malaysian. So how do I purchase my gear as a student? If we go way back, uh, back to my first DSLR, it was a Canon 550D. That was not purchased using my own money. That was a gift from my father. And if we're talking about today, I'm a university student and everybody knows university costs a bomb but I am on a full scholarship, so I'm very grateful that I don't have to pay for the education, and I also spend my free time creating content on YouTube. And on YouTube, they run ads, so I do get a small amount of return off of my content on YouTube. So I save up what's left after paying for the bills and invest most of it on gear. Do you think the Canon EFS 35mm f2.8 macro is a usable macro lens? Under which circumstances would you prefer it over a 60 or 100mm macro? So I believe you are referring to the April 2017 one, the STM with the built-in LED light. I've actually never had any experience with that lens, I've never held it before. It just seemed like one of those unpopular lenses that for some reason dropped under the radar and nobody ever has one. But based on what I've read about it, it does seem like a very usable macro lens under which condition would I prefer it over the 60mm or the 100mm, definitely for the fact that it has that integrated LED light and you always need a lot of light when you do macro photography. And it does make sense because it's a 35mm lens, which means if you want your one-to-one -one magnification ratio, you have to go very up close to your subject, which increases the effectiveness of the light. My only consideration would perhaps be the working distance because it's a 35mm, you may have to get very, very up close to your subject. If you're photographing very sensitive subjects like insects, then that might make your work a bit more difficult. YouTube community tab is still not on iPad. Software developers, is it really that difficult? Why do I use Canon? Well, my first DSLR was a Canon, so I continued investing in Canon glass and eventually I was bound into their ecosystem. But I do think in terms of cameras, Canon is one of the more user-friendly brands out there. The way their cameras are designed are just more pleasant to use from the ergonomics to the menu design. But I do have to admit, feature-wise, they are pathetic. I just haven't found a strong enough reason to switch systems yet because it's a lot of trouble, but if one day if there's a big enough deal breaker on Canon's behalf or there's a big enough incentive for me to switch to another system, then I very probably will. Do you think filming in RAW with Magic Lantern is worth the time? And if yes, what is your workflow? I didn't really think it was worth my time. The only times I filmed with Magic Lantern RAW was purely just to try it out. I've never really used it on a job because I didn't feel that I could completely rely on it. It's always been kind of sketchy. Plus the fact that you couldn't record audio, which can be a huge inconvenience. But if I were to use Magic Lantern RAW, my workflow would be to use the tool. I cannot name the exact tool at the moment. I kind of forgot what it's called. But there is a tool that converts the Magic Lantern RAW file into Cinema DNG. And then I would just work with the DNG internally in DaVinci Resolve. And we have three questions from this gentleman here. That's perfectly fine. Uh, what is still photography? I was looking for a photography course at our university and I saw one called Still Photography and Communication. Can you explain this? So that's referring to stills, as in an image that doesn't move, a single photograph, as we would say. Because if you were to just say photography in general, it could be confused with motion photography, because moving images, which also classifies as a type of photography. So in this case, still photography means not video. 
Have you ever made a short film? If not, are you going to make one in the near future? I've actually made quite a number of short films. I am a film student and we are basically required by the curriculum to make a number of short films throughout our degree. Am I going to make one in the near future? At the moment, probably not. But if there is a story that comes by that I really want to tell, then I probably will consider making a short film out of it. One more question. What is the difference between cinematographer and director of photography? Are these the same? Yes, they are the same. They're the exact same position, the same role, and they are used interchangeably, but there are a lot of cinematographers or DOPs who prefer the term cinematographer. It sounds like a more a creative oriented title as opposed to director of photography which sounds a bit more technical but just to avoid confusion cinematographer DOP same thing for still photo editing of Lightroom and Photoshop it seems somewhat overwhelming for the novice photographer what are the basics one should pay attention to using these software packages and primarily shooting wildlife and birds still using iPhoto that's no longer supported Thanks, David. In terms of basics, it's definitely helpful if you are familiar with how to read a histogram, which would help you a lot in balancing your exposure and tweaking your contrast, adjusting your shadows and your highlights. And then there's color balancing, compensating for the white balance and also the tint. And then you'll start using localized adjustments like uh, dodging and burning for adjusting specific parts of the images and also other functions to enhance specific parts of the images in very specific ways. Just trust your eyes, but make sure to take a break after you've been at it for a while because it's very important that you come back later and look at it with fresh eyes so you don't overdo your adjustments. Speaking for Lightroom, always begin by familiarizing yourself with the management work workflow, uh, how to call your images, rating your images, how to generate previews, how to synchronize adjustments across photos. What's the lens that you don't want to use but have to use? <laughs> this thing, the Canon 50mm f1.4. This is an ancient piece of crap lens, even the nifty 50 outperforms this lens. So yeah, I'm stuck with this as my 50mm lens at the moment. It's uh, not the most joyful lens to use. But I will definitely upgrade it one day when I have the financial provisions to do so. What is an AA filter and what's the difference with and without? So the anti-aliasing filter is also known as an OLPF, an optical low pass filter. The function of the AA filter is literally just to soften the image ever so slightly so you can see why some people want it removed. But it's there for a reason and that's to prevent moiré as a result of aliasing. So moiré, you may have come across it, it's basically the pattern that appears when you try and photograph really fine details or textures. So with an AA filter slash OLPF, you will have an ever so slightly softer image but you have less chances of running into moiré. Without it, you get an ever so slightly sharper image, but your images are highly susceptible to moiré. 47 megapixels versus 24 megapixels, how are they different in post for landscape? Does landscape photography need 47 megapixels for post and cropping, considering between Z7 or Z6? In my opinion, 24 megapixels is enough. 47 megapixels in most situations is more than enough unless you are shooting for commercial photography or massive printouts. In my opinion, for day-to-day -day use, 24 megapixels is enough. 47 megapixels is a bit much, not to mention that 47 megapixel file sizes are going to cost you quite a bit of storage. Uh, I've never really tried the Z6, but I have spent a day with the Z7, which is a very, very expensive mirrorless camera. I didn't like it. For a flagship mirrorless camera, it just felt slightly slow for me, but that's just my personal opinion. About Samyang lenses, well, they are very affordable lenses. They are not the most amazing of lenses. They're not going to straight up wow you, but it's very nice what they're doing. They're making these video-oriented lenses, even cinema lenses, accessible and affordable to consumers. How do you apply hyperfocal distance to use in real-world shooting? That is a very, very excellent question. I have personally never used a hyperfocal distance calculator to shoot any single image before. <laughs> it's a very good theory to study and know of, but I just didn't find it particularly widely applicable compared to something like the inverse square law. But I do hear that hyperfocal distance is more widely applied in landscape photography. So I would imagine if you are shooting a wide landscape and you had a foreground subject that's pretty near to the camera and you also wanted to keep everything in the distance in focus, then you would use a hyperfocal distance calculator to work out what f-stop you should be shooting at so that when you're focused at infinity, your hyperfocal distance doesn't exceed the distance of the nearest subject that's away from your camera. 
Another application for hyperfocal distance is not in actual photography, but more towards the manufacturing of fixed focus lenses. That's when hyperfocal distance would really come in handy for designing the optics. In terms of where they should set the fixed focus point at, I would imagine that this was more applicable back in the film and analog days because nowadays you can just shoot the image and then review it on your screen just to make sure that what you want to be sharp is in fact sharp and make adjustments from there on. Can an average person tell the difference between 10-bit versus 8-bit and 420 versus 422? Short answer, no. If you were just to visually look at footage, I would say it's impossible to tell what bit depth it was shot on and what was the chroma subsampling on the footage. You will really start to notice the difference when you do something to the footage in post, when you are color correcting it, when you're color grading it, or when you're doing VFX with it. That's when the larger bit depth will give you more levels to work with when you're doing color grading and lesser chances of banding. And when you're doing things like green screen, that's when the 422 would really benefit you over 420. So I believe that was all the questions we had for today. Thank you all so much for sending in these questions. Keep them coming. Comment any more questions you may have down in the comment section below. And I will see you again for Ask Z in another month's time. Until then, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next video.